To know when to mate, a male giraffe will continuously headbutt the female in the bladder until she urinates. The male then tastes the pee and that helps determine whether the female is ovulating or not. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about when it is appropriate to start hangboarding. I know that Eva Lopez, whose protocol you reference, recommends two to three years of climbing before beginning her program. What's your opinion as a climber slash PT? Research that done with climbing is still really progressing. It's still pretty new. So unfortunately, there's no like definitive timeline out there that says exactly when you should start hangboarding. Um, I'm more like in the six to 12 month camp if you can do it safely. Um, but you really don't want to start a hangboarding program earlier than that because really you need to learn the skill and the art of climbing and focusing on your technique before you try and get too heavy into the training component. One of the fears of starting a max hang or general hangbird protocol too early is that adding weight to a crimp grip adds strain and stress to our joints and pulleys. This can set you up for an injury to the pulley or can cause joint inflammation or synovitis, which can cause long stoppages in your climbing. The key is, if you picked up on it, how you introduce crimping to your climbing. Going from no crimping at all to crimping everything is terrible, but easing your way into it is what will allow your tissue to adapt more casually to these changes. I've seen people who've climbed for only one year develop joint synovitis and they never hangboarded, but they got like really good, really quick, and part of that progression was doing a ton of crimping with their climbing. It's the same problem, too much, too quickly. Moderating the amount of crimping and working your way up to it is better. So if you can start with just some like super simple training and moderate how much of it you can do, you can start this process of hangboarding earlier. The problem is that people often get like too stoked too quickly and they just add a bunch of weight, they keep climbing, they don't change their training at all and that leads to these injuries. I tried doing some tenon gliding but my right middle finger couldn't bend all the way um, to touch the top of my palm, that top row due to synovitis. Should I be trying to push down using my other hand to get full range of motion? Okay, so this is a great question and a good thing to clarify about tenon gliding because a lot of people will experience this. So when you're trying to get that top row, a lot of people will feel that limited range of motion, um, but I don't recommend adding that like that extra pressure from the other hand immediately with it. Rather give tenon gliding a chance, so to speak. Like give it a few days to a week of just trying to work on your tenon glides and see if it starts to improve. See if you start to notice an improvement, like hey, I'm getting closer and closer to being able to touch that top row before you start to try and jam it in there. Now, if you do feel like you have pretty limited mobility and you're just not making progress with the tenon glides alone, there may be other tools for you to do to improve that joint mobility, whether that's like a joint distraction or a kind of like increasing that joint space or other more specific tools. Now, that might mean you need to go see a specialist who can kind of teach you those things or work on that joint mobility with you, um, but that would be my recommendation. So like, don't just start with the overpressure, see if the tenon gliding itself will help improve that joint mobility. Maybe do some light joint distractions to increase that joint space before you do it. Um, and then at the, like the, the highest level would be to see a specialist and see if they can help you with that joint mobility. Does cracking your knuckles have any effect on hardworking climbing fingers? Is it creating more trauma to the extra sensitive joints or the action doesn't affect the fingers in the same way? <sighs> Cracking your knuckles is simply expanding the joint space far enough for that individual joint to cause that cavitation. This is a harmless activity when there's enough strength supporting the joint. Research has helped debunk the age-old thought that cracking your knuckles causes arthritis. Cracking your joints is only harmful if you're continually doing it to a mobile joint that doesn't have the strength from supporting muscles. So let's break this down. So we look at a balanced body as having good mobility and stability. Cracking your knuckles increases mobility. Too much mobility and not enough stability causes issues. But if there's balance and you have good mobility and stability, it's not an issue. So with the hands, we're constantly working them, especially with climbing and whatnot, so we have good stability. So cracking the knuckles to improve mobility is balanced out. 
But let's look at another example. If you have neck pain, which is due to like weak cervical, like paraspinals or the stabilizer muscles that help support your neck, if you continually crack it, it may increase that joint space or increase the mobility, which isn't really solving the problem even though the cracking feels good, you're just masking it. Your problem is that you have too much mobility and not enough stability. But your answer to mobilize the segment further by cracking it is only increasing the mobility. So there are terms where like, are times when cracking your knuckles or cracking a joint is not beneficial if you already have too much mobility and not enough stability. But if there's good stability to support that joint, feel free, crack those knuckles, no problem. Should you train even if you're feeling sore? Is it better to push through the muscle soreness or wait until recovered in order to train at maximum effort? Okay, so that's really important and it's definitely better to wait until you've recovered to continue your training. The main reason being that training on injured or not fully recovered tissue will limit your ability to produce maximum effort or force. If you cannot produce a high enough level of effort or force, you're not training your muscles under the correct conditions to promote proper tissue adaptations. This causes your training to be ineffective. So think of like just tires spinning in mud. It may also lead to an overuse injury as you're not fully resting the tissue before applying that strain and stress to it again. If you're sore and want to train, you can try and train other body parts or train mobility. Of course, don't forget the most undervalued component of training though, rest. It's okay to do some light climbing where you're more focused on like your technique. You shouldn't be trying to project at your hardest level. Um, you shouldn't be doing limit bouldering or anything like that because again, you cannot produce that maximum force. But if you're doing you know, things that are a little bit beneath your level and you're repeating it till it feels like really easy and working on different ways of going through that movement and just working on technique, then that's one of those situations where you can do a little bit of training when you're sore. Um, but overall, if you're really sore, you're not working on that maximum effort, you need to rest and recover. How the hell have you 4,000 subscribers? Well, I mean, we're like almost at 5,000 now, but I don't know. Come on, internet. Algorithms and shares and likes and stuff. I've done almost every form of rehab I can think of. In the video, you use farmer crimps for tendon slash pulley injuries. Do you think that this rehab can be applied to a collateral ligament injury? All right, so before we get to your specific question, I have to address the fact that in your question, you state the injury has lasted for two years. So when an injury lasts that long, my immediate response is twofold. One, does pain science apply to this case, which is why you're on this video? And two, what is the individual doing to constantly like re-aggravate the injury? You may need to take a deeper look into your like activities of daily living, work, climbing style, etc. Because if you're constantly re-aggravating the injury, that's the first step in your recovery process. To address the second part where you ask like, is farmer crimps going to be helpful for this? I'd say not necessarily, and simply because the collateral ligaments are put under more strain and stress with varus or valgus forces, meaning like when the finger joint is creating a force like left or right versus the farmer crimp, which is gonna put it more under load in this like flexed position. So it's not gonna kind of recreate the scenario that's gonna apply that force to it. It's not gonna hurt it, you know, and it may have some benefit just loading that tissue, but it may not directly help in rehabbing the injury. I have a question slash clarification regarding the pain level protocol and monitoring. How should the pain level be monitored? During the load and timed after the load is clearly stated, but how do we let our body tell us? Meaning, should we like touch slash move slash apply some sort of pressure to the sensitive part or just without any touch slash movement slash pressure? Okay, so I think the bottom line question here is, do you pay attention to the pain level just when the tissue is under force? Like when you're loading it like yourself or with a farmer crimp? Or do you pay attention to like the pain level after the force, like by moving it around or by kind of poking and prodding at it? So that is a good question to help kind of clarify. We do want to mostly pay attention to how it feels when it is under that force because we're recreating the scenario of the injured tissue. Just like kind of poking and prodding at it isn't going to give you great information because that's maybe activating a different type of pain because you're just creating direct pressure over it. Also, just kind of moving it around right afterwards if you had applied a large amount of force to it you know, may not give you great information because it's, it's simply not the same type of load that you're creating to the tissue. Now, the one realm one that can be beneficial is, and we mentioned this in the video, 
Say you apply that like force to it and then the symptoms last for like more than 30 seconds after you remove the force and maybe you went to like a three or a four out of 10 when really we want you sticking to like that one or a two, then it's okay to start supplementing it. Like, is it really sharp when you press on it now? Um, is it painful when you move your finger throughout that motion? And does that stay the same or does that start to get better? You can use that information like as supplemental information, but you really do wanna keep the attention and the focus on how it feels with the load and without. Try not to get drawn into the distraction too much of like poking at it and like feeling how it feels as you're just like prodding that tissue. But good question. For some reason I'm just slow this morning. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know for some reason everything feels really close to me right now. I think that's why. Yeah, I think that I think that's why it's weirding me out because I'm like, why is it claustrophobic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Start slow and be safe and stay smart. Or be smart. Damn it! I killed my own line.